All right, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Let's get started. So today we'll be talking about sensation and perception. And sensation is kind of about how information from the external world, but that desk in front of you uh, comes in through your fingertips and those receptors in your skin. And then perception is about the, the top level where it's your experience is a construction of your mind. We'll talk about the five senses and how we perceive them. Um, there is a section on, on hearing that addresses hearing loss in a way that I'd like to talk about in a bit more detail. We are starting late today because of some, some tech issues with the projector going into idle. And so if I have to end early, I will end on time. I would just record the rest of the lecture from the lab and then splice that onto the end and send it out to you guys. Sensation and perception are parts of one continuous process. Okay, and just a moment. Um, and that's a process about how we receive and experience the world outside of us. Sensation is about how information about the world outside our brain, because your, your experience is all stuck in your skull up there, right? How that comes to you. And that information comes into your body as light waves, as sound waves, as chemical molecules in the air or in what you eat or as pressure or heat applied to your body. And all of that incoming information has to be translated into that electrochemical language of your nervous system. Perception is at the high level, okay? And that's that mental poetry of interpreting those electrochemical signals and using them to construct your consciousness. It's that magic that makes you hear sound waves as music and see light waves as colors. Sensation is basically a bottom-up process where the sensory receptors in your body, say in your tongue, at the back of your eye, in your fingertips, okay, bring in information from outside your body and send it up to your brain. It's like the information from the, the front lines of the real world are coming up to you and you're in your head. And then perception is basically a top-down process where what you believe, what you experience about the world out there is constructed in your mind. It's what your mind says and tells you about the real world. Transduction is the word for how that information from the real world is translated into the electrochemical language of the brain and the nervous system. And all that information has to get turned into neural firing, patterns of firing. Psychophysics is the subdiscipline of psychology that studies the relationships between the physical energy that your body detects and how you experience it psychologically. And that father of that discipline is um, Gustav Fechner, who's a German psychologist, physicist, and philosopher. And remember that psychology is kind of an interplay between um, biology, physics, and philosophy, who sought to relate matter to mind, to connect the objective external material world to your privately experienced impression of it. Now, there's a lot of stimuli out there and you're not aware of, of all of it. There are strengths and weaknesses in our human ability to detect stimuli. And of course, there's gonna be individual uh, variation as well, okay? So some people don't see visually. But we as a species do not sort of see or detect X-rays, radio waves, ultraviolet rays, right? Infrared light. We don't hear very high frequency or very low frequency sounds. And in fact, um, younger people can, can hear mosquitoes, but somebody my age can't hear a mosquito coming. And that's because as we get older, we sort of lose some of that ability and have a more restricted range of, of hearing available to us. Other animals have sensory or perceptual systems that we don't have. Birds use a magnetic compass. Bats and dolphins use sonar. Cats can detect really small movements much more quickly than we do. 
you might not notice at all, but your cat did it. That? And bees and ants see the polarization of sunlight for navigation. That's an impression of maybe how a bee might see a flower and the markings on the flower are helping it navigate to the nectar. We've evolved to see the world as we need to see it and in ways that are adaptive for us as humans. We don't see that or we don't see what a bee sees because we don't need to, right? We don't need to go and, and get that nectar. But we can feel better with our fingertips, right? Or use our hands better than any other animal with their sort of hand equivalent or their paw, okay? Even more than say like a raccoon. You know, raccoons have that, that little washing habit. Have you ever seen that? It's not washing because they're putting it in a filthy puddle. And what the water actually does is help them feel better because their little hands and fingers don't feel as well as ours. They have to go and find some kind of a puddle, put the thing underwater, and then they kind of feel it. Right? That, that's not washing, uh, but it, it does help them feel. And feeling with our hands is, is something that we do really well. And you can see that on the sensory homunculus and on the motor homunculus. And that ability has served us very well. It's been very adaptive for using, we use tools with great dexterity. Now, it takes a certain amount of stimulation for us to sense that stimulus. You can hear my voice now. If I spoke softly at about half the volume, you can still hear it. But if I kept going, okay, and I kept going softer and softer, there would come a point where you can't hear it anymore. Okay, it would get harder and harder to pick it up over all the background noise. People typing on their laptops, people moving in their seats. Right? And at some point, you might only hear it about half the time. And that's called the absolute threshold. So the absolute threshold for detecting something is reached when we can detect it half the time that it's presented. The other half the time, you don't notice. It escapes notice. So what about stimuli that fall below that threshold? The Latin word for threshold is limina. And stimuli that that are weak enough to fall below that threshold, so maybe you only detect them, say, 49% of the time, or less than that, are called subliminal, or below that threshold. It's a, a subliminal message is one that's too quiet or faded or fast for you to be reliably aware that it was happening. And now, this is a bit of a joke, but the message in that picture over there is not subliminal because you can obviously see it, right? But to make that a subliminal message, it'd have to be much, much lighter or be flashed really quickly so that you would notice it was there less than half the time. There is an effective subliminal stimuli, but it's like the stimulus itself, quite weak. And it has been used in advertising. You might remember in that memory lecture, I primed you three or four different ways that you might not have noticed. And then when I asked you what cows drink, you didn't say water because I gave you about four different sort of primes for milk that you might not have noticed. So subliminal priming activates associations in your mind and it sets you up to perceive or remember or respond to objects or events in certain ways. It has a fleeting, a subtle, not a powerful or enduring effect on behavior. And so experiments don't support the idea that one small subliminal stimulus would have a big effect on your behavior. It doesn't support the idea that a self-help tape playing subliminal self-esteem boosting messages are, are going to change your life. Okay? However, I'm not aware of any study that looks at the overall effect of many coordinated subliminal stimuli. Right? Let's say they were all coordinated and coming at you all day long from different directions. I'm not aware of that study. It sounds like the kind of thing that the like a KGB research program. There's also a threshold for noticing a difference between two things, say the weight of two different objects. So if you had a, let's say a, a five gram weight and a 50 gram weight, can you tell that one is heavier or lighter than the other? Well, you can if it's five and 50, but what about five grams and six grams, right? Is it a one gram different that matters? Not quite, it's actually relative, okay? So that's um, called Weber's law. It's, the, it's that it's a relative difference that you, that, sorry, a relative difference that you notice. So 
Um, the value of that difference, like is it 5%, is it 1% different, depends on the stimulus, on the thing. And that number is different for the difference in weight between two objects or the difference in tone between two sets. So I'm not asking you to remember this, it's just an example, but for tone, it's 0.5% of the frequency of the tone or about one tenth of a musical half step. And that's for the average person, not that guy who can probably uh, hear it really, really well because he's learned to do that or has maybe uh, is gifted in that regard. But my point there is that it's about a relative difference and it varies for different stimuli. If a stimulus is presented to us and nothing important happens, we'll react to it less and less. And that's an adaptive thing because you only have so much cognitive bandwidth and you have to spend it on what matters, not noticing everything everywhere all the time. So if you present a tone to a dog and you pair that with food, the dog will learn to be extremely interested in that tone, okay? But if you were to present the tone to a dog and then do nothing, well, the dog would prick up its ears the first time, like, hey, what's that? I haven't heard that before. And you keep doing it, it would just learn to ignore it. So we notice what's adaptive for us to notice, okay? If you noticed everything all the time, it would be impossible to focus. So you have a natural ability and might be greater in some people and lesser than others to tune things out. So if there was a noisy fan in this room, uh, you'd notice it at first, maybe you think it was annoying, and then you'd notice it less and less, and then not at all. But let's say I turn the fan off, you would notice that it's suddenly quiet. And it's adaptive for you to notice that because it's been a sudden change and that could signal something important. The, the monster came in the room and turned off the fan, part of his grand plan, okay? So you notice that something could be going on, or like what, what just happened there? And then you have an opportunity to scan the environment for a threat. No, okay, we're good. And then go back to what you're doing. So we get used to things really quickly. There are these inversion goggles that make people see everything upside down. And it's incredibly disorienting at first, but after about like, I don't know, half an hour, an hour of feeling really seasick, people adjust and navigate their environment like a pro. We also perceive things in a top-down way. We have, we all have schemas, mental frameworks about how the world works. It could be based on your own experience. Maybe they're taught to you by society, but we all have schemas. And those schemas matter because we use them to interpret ambiguous experiences. So if we are highly sexually motivated, we're likely to perceive someone else's friendliness as flirtation. Not because they are flirting, because that we're interpreting that within, let's say, a very dating-focused schema, okay? If somebody has a deep-seated belief or schema that a young Black man has a violent nature, then the skittles in his pocket are perceived as a gun. Not because they are, because maybe that officer has a predisposition to interpret that ambiguous stimuli, the lump in the pocket, in a certain way, and then make a decision based on that. So let us be aware of our schema. Here's a, a famous example from psychology. And there's a picture, there's a group of people there chatting and there's some ambiguous stimuli back there. They're sort of sketched out, they're not fully filled in. They're ambiguous because they could be one thing or the other. Now, if you show this to people in East Africa who spend most of their day outside, what they see this as is a tree. People are outside. They're under a tree and uh, this person here has a sort of some kind of a, a container balanced on it. Because that would be normal for that particular group. But you show this to people like us in the Western world and the person, the people are in a room, that's a pillar and this person's sitting under a window. Same stimuli is being read or seen in different ways based on what we expect and understand about the world. Now you've probably heard of extrasensory perception, ESP. There has been a line of research on this. So that's the claim that perception can occur apart from sensory input. So things like 
telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition. Okay, so the claims of, of psychics have quite overwhelmingly been debunked, right? No one's ever found Madeline, except there is a series of quite oppressively well done experiments by uh, psychologist Daryl Bem uh, that you should look into if you're interested in this. So humans are very visual creatures compared to other animals we see quite well. Now, I wonder, some animals have their eyes kind of on the front of their faces and some on the sides of their faces. What do you think might be going on with that? Yes. Yeah. So we can focus. And, and track. Another thing it gives you is depth perception because depth perception is something your brain computes out of the retinal disparity between your two eyes, right? Each one of your eyes has see something different and that's combined into an image. Um, that gives you a sense of how far away what you're trying to catch is. And if you look at the animals that have the eyes on the sides of their heads, they're, they're the animals that have to save themselves from us and they like to have a really big view of what's going on. Um, now, our perceptual system combines the images we see from both eyes into one images. But rodents don't do that. Their eyes move independently. Could you imagine what that would? But uh, so they see two separate pictures. And they would interpret that when they are expertly navigating their environment, dodging cats and getting into all your stuff. So it serves them and their purposes. Now there's a neural process by which light is detected by the sensory receptors in the eye, turned into that uh, electrochemical signal that's then sent to your visual cortex. And I pulled those from your textbook. And if you need more than this on the textbook, I'd encourage you to check your resources, say in Launchpad, there's some videos or um, there's other recommended resources on Brightspace, like the two minute neuroscience channel on YouTube, if you want. Um, I think those can help you learn that if you're getting lost in the book. Now, what happens if you rub your eyes? Do you see anything? Does anything happen? Is your visual field completely dark? No, what's happening? Do you see something that's light, light-ish? Lights and stars. Exactly. So what, do you know what's happening there? Something on the walls. Yeah, so those light receptors are incredibly sensitive and they also respond to the pressure that you're putting on. So you're, there's, it's not, they're not seeing light, but they are getting stimulated by the pressure. And that's why you see something, it's kind of, it's kind of weird. I don't know. I see something kind of yellowy, greenish, but uh, that's what's going on there. Um, so they're very sensitive and you can activate them. And that shows you that the message, what you're perceiving is about the activation of this receptor. Color processing occurs in two stages. So um, at the back of your eye, you have rods and cones. And the rods are for black white vision, they're in your peripheral vision, and they don't pick things up quite so clearly. Your color vision has to do with the cones, and they're red, green, and blue cones. And that's associated with the young Helmholtz trichromatic theory. So three different cones, red, green, and blue. But the cones' responses have to get sent up to your brain. And that goes through a, a system of channels. So there's a red green channel, there is a black white channel, and there is a yellow blue channel. And that is suggested by an, uh, an opponent process theory. So there were competing theories of vision, and it turned out that they were both kind of right, but at different places in the, the process of vision. Some color information is lost in those higher channels, which can only handle so much information. And that explains why we can see some color combinations like yellowish green, chartreuse, but not others like reddish green. 
And that has to do with the way the color information is, is sent up and is lost along the way that's suppressed at the channel level. Butterflies do not have that problem. They see more colors. So they could tell us what reddish green looks like. This is from your textbook. I think it's a, a nice chart for that simplifies visual processing. So it starts with the scene, then um, the light comes into the receptors in your eye. And there are feature cells. There are neurons that fire when you see something like a like horizontal line or a vertical line. And that get, all that information has to get combined, sent up to your brain and then unpacked again, okay? If you are getting confused when you're studying the color stuff, please keep in mind that there's different rules and results for mixing colored light versus colored paint. And you're probably used to mixing paint colors, but your eye is dealing with light colors. So yellow is a primary color of paint, but when we're talking about your eye, we're talking about light. And so yellow is the combination of red and green light. The entire spectrum of electromagnetic energy ranges from teeny tiny little gamma rays, or as short as the diameter of an atom, and we don't see those, to radio waves that are like 100 kilometers long. We don't see those either. The wavelengths that we can actually see, and they're enlarged in that picture, start with the shorter waves of blue-violet light and go up to the longer waves of red light. You can't see x-rays or broadcast bands. And if you could, that, I wonder what that would look like. Now, you, you've probably all heard that, that grass is green, but what, is that, what does that mean? Unpack that one for me. Yes. So it is reflect, that's true. Yeah, it's reflecting out a certain wavelength. I'm gonna guess that it's 500-ish, could be completely wrong about that, but it's some wavelength. And is that wavelength green? And where is the greenness happening? Does every animal see green when they look at that? Some humans don't. Right? There are people who are colorblind or red, green, colorblind. But the greenness, the experience of green is, is happening in your mind. Right? It's a much higher level process. Now, yeah. you've probably all seen this, right? Can I get a show of hands for people who see this as is anyone seeing this as a white and gold dress? I got a sense. It's kind of half, half-ish, maybe just under half the room. Okay, and who's very clearly seeing this as a blue and black dress? It's a bit more, like it was maybe 40, 60. So about 40% of you are honestly, really and truly perceiving this as a white and gold dress. And the other 60% of the room are like, what are you nuts? That is the blue and black dress. But your experiences are totally real to you, right? How could that be happening? What's going on there? And obviously you can all agree on the color of this dress. No? Okay. Do you, did you have an idea? Does anyone know what's going on there? Don't know. Okay, I have a little exercise. It works on me and I'm egocentric, so I'm guessing that it also works on you. Let's, let's see if it does. Okay. Your perception of color is about an awful lot more than the sensation of wavelength. Okay, on the next slide, I'm going to be showing you a flag. It's a striped flag. Okay, and it has gold and white stripes. And it's the flag of a tropical island where the main exports are pineapple and coconut. Okay. That flag is raised and it's flapping in the sun, but half of it is, is in a shadow, okay? So this is a 
gold and white flag of pineapples and coconut with a shadow cast on it. Do you see that? Look at that super obvious gold color and white. And there's the shadow falling on the gold stripe. Do you see that? As, okay. All right, well, let's try that one again. Okay, so forget that. Okay, on the next slide, I'm gonna be showing you a striped flag, okay? It has cobalt blue and black stripes. This is a dark, wintry place. The main exports are cobalt and deep blue sapphires and coal, okay, which they find in these cold, dark mines. It's a, it's a bright cobalt blue and jet black. Now, we're flying this flag in this dark place, but the, there is a little sunlight and some of it is shining on the top left corner of the flag. And where the sun is shining on the flag, it, it bleaches it out, okay? It looks washed out by all that light. What can I, what are you perceiving? Is this coming across you as blue and black or white and, and yellow? Oh, darn, okay. It's even happening to me. I'm starting to see, like I saw that as clearly blue and black, just like the dress. And now even I'm starting to see it as, as yellow and white. Um, if you want to get the blue and black effect, look at it over here, just here. Forget that, focus, focus. See this in black. Just stare at this, it's black, okay? Move your eye out. Oh. This is blue. It's like um, royal blue, cobalt blue, sapphire kind of just focusing over here. Have you seen blue and, and black yet? Yeah. yeah? Okay, so now you can, Keeping in mind, this is jet black and this is sapphire blue. Slowly let your mind see the rest of the flag up here. Yeah, we're still. Okay, now see some of that light, that sunlight starting to shine on it. And, and it's washing out that black a bit. It's washing out that blue. Can you see it as blue and black yet? Who's it working for? Can anyone get to blue and black? a little bit, maybe the bit in the corner. Okay. And so that is the dress effect. So that is a blue or a black dress or white or a gold dress, depending on what assumption you're making about sunlight. Okay, these are the same colors as the dress. That most of you saw as blue and black. And then saw that flag as orange and, and white after we did that little setup with pineapples and um, and coconuts, okay. So color perception depends on context, okay? So those three discs are identical in color. One of them looks really bright because you know that that's in, in a shadow, okay? So perceiving, ob we perceive objects as having a consistent color, even when changing illumination alters the wavelengths reflected by the objects. So that's what's going on with your, your dress and your flag. Now, you will probably see A and B as having a different shade. They're actually exactly the same in terms of like the wavelength that's falling on your retina. A and B are the same. But what's messing you up is the idea that there's, there's light over here and this ball is casting shadow. And um, computers use this to test whether you're a person or a robot because humans make these mistakes so reliably that you know, if it asks you a question based on this, if you're a human, you'll think there's a difference, but a computer would think there wasn't because it would know that those two blocks are actually exactly the same. Tell me about these, this, this pair of pairs. Is one of the pairs lighter than the other? I see you shaking your head, no. So that green is the same as that green. But your interpretation of that green is based on what's next to it. And context matters in psychology. It matters in perception 
of wavelengths and it really matters in, in social psychology and too often in psychology we forget the importance of context. What about these dots? How many colors are there of dot? I heard five. Is it one? Yes, it's one. Yeah, so this color here, right? Look at like the, the ball behind us, right? This color, the same as this color, the same as this color. It's very obvious to me being this close up, but from your distance and the fact that context matters and you're interpreting these other colors that are in front of it or around it, it's making it look like they're different colors to you. Okay, this is an easier way to explain it. Sort of simplifies it a bit. Um, but this color here is exactly the same as that color there. But because of the role of those stripes that are around it, you're probably seeing that as blue and that as green. They're the same. So your interpretation of color depends on the colors that are around it. It's a really high level brain process. It's about so much more than a wavelength. Here's another one. Okay. How many dots are there? <laughs> this is an easy question, guys. <laughs> So you're all seeing the same thing. How many dots? I've heard one or two. Okay, so I've heard one or two, and I've also heard 12. Anyone see more than 12? Yes. So I can't hear you. There's no dots. Zero. Okay, we have everything from zero to 12. And you're all seeing, seeing, seeing the same thing. It's right up there in front of you. It's very objective. I'm confused by your responses. So the answer is 12. They're plain as day, right out there staring at you. Why can't you see 12? Now, if you want to see the 12, you have to start up here. Hey, look at that. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now here's a third row. One, two, three, four. Four, there's three rows of four, it makes 12. Why can't you see them all at once? In the background. I think you're getting onto it with the idea of background. So there's a part of your visual field where you see clearly. Anyone know what that part is? Things that fall on the, I think it's the fovea. You'll see that clearly. And everything else is your peripheral vision. And your peripheral vision is pretty blurry. And your brain has to make an image for you that pieces that together somehow, okay? So to see all 12 dots at once, which you can't do, you have to use both your central and your peripheral vision. And your peripheral vision is not up to that. You can only see the dot when you look right at it, okay? So the dots that are flashing at you and away from you are things uh, that the rods in your peripheral vision are picking up. Okay, we have pretty bad peripheral vision, okay? So if you're, let's say you're reading your textbook or your notes and you focus on just the letter you're writing or typing, you'll see that word clearly, but really like if you didn't move your eyes and you just stared at that word, everything else is pretty blurry and fuzzy around it. But you keep looking from here to there to there and your brain is kind of filling in the rest. Okay, so your brain has to make its best guess about what is probably going on in that whole fuzzy periphery. But your experience is of seeing clearly, 
not of just seeing clearly in one place and everything being kind of blurry or fuzzy. Uh, the flip side of this is that your brain also sort of fills in lines that aren't really there. So in this figure, see that's a sort of a shape with three lines. It's very easy for your brain, especially if you focus on that X, to construct uh, kind of a, a cube shape. And it's very easy for your brain to fill in lines here. It might look to you like they're, they're diagonal lines. They actually aren't. What's going on here? <laughs> Hopefully I don't give anyone a seizure. Does it look like it's kind of scintillating? Something's white, then it's gray, then it's black. That's kind of hard to look at. Now, this, what's going on here neurologically, the neuroscience of this is super complicated. And so this is not going to be on the test and you do not need to know, but if you were just dying to know what's going on here, there's a neural process called lateral inhibition. So the intensity at a point in the visual system isn't just the result of a single receptor, but the way a group of receptors work together in something called a receptive field. And in the center of the field, um, the receptors are act excitatory on the signal. They're firing. And then the surrounding ones are inhibitory on the signal and they're suppressing, okay? And so since a point in an intersection is surrounded by more intensity than a point of the middle of the line, the intersection looks darker. And in your eyes, the nerve cells of the retina associate and interact with each other. And that results in the illusion that there are dots. There are no dots. Okay. Does that make you question your sanity a little? Um, these lines, um, is one of these lines longer or the same length? Hands up if you see that one line is clearly longer than the other. Okay, about a third-ish. Are the lines the same? Yes, you're right, they are the same, but because look at where this one starts and that one starts and they end also the same places, but your mind is interpreting this in this context of these, this looks like a picture of a railway. And one depth cue that we have is that things that are further away come closer together. And so interpreting that in that kind of 3D way, um, it would look like this line is longer because it's been put, it's further up on the railway tracks, right? That's what your brain is doing. Same kind of idea here. Those windows in terms of the image that they're projecting on your retina are exactly the same size but your brain is interpreting them in the context where this is closer to you and that is further away. And so this looks like a smaller window that's closer up and this looks like a bigger window that's further back. So same idea here, those blue circles are exactly the same size. And now you're probably getting better at this and it's easier for you to see that the circles are the same size, maybe. But here it's small in the context of these big circles. And here it's big in the context of these small circles. Context matters, it matters so much that you're perceiving or possibly perceiving these exactly identical blue circles as different from each other in size based on what's around them. That explains the moon illusion. The moon is always the same size. It's been that way your entire life. But sometimes it honestly looks to you like the moon is small, kind of high up. And sometimes it looks like the moon is big, but it's not, it's always the same. It's going on in your head. Okay, the image that's getting projected onto your retina is the same in each case. Probably seen this one before, it could be famous. So this is called a figure ground illusion. 
And depending, you see something different depending on what you assume is the figure is in front, what you assume is the background. So if you assume that the white part is the figure, then you see two faces looking at each other. But if you assume that the black part is the figure, then you see some kind of fancy vase that you might, you know, put a candle in it, kind of candelabra thing. Bigger ground illusion. And you've probably seen these ones too. Who sees a duck? Who sees a rabbit? About half and half. Same kind of thing. So uh, the duck, this is the beak of the duck. That's the eye of the duck, head of the duck, neck of the duck. Now to see it as a rabbit, uh, just, just shake that out of your head. The rabbit has these ears and it's the rabbit's eye and the rabbit's nose and mouth would be there and it's facing a different direction. This is a, a pretty famous one. Again, same kind of idea. You might see this as an old lady or as a young woman. And it sort of depends on, on how you interpret her choker. So who sees a, a young woman? Half, you see a young woman. Who sees an old woman? Only one person sees the old woman. Okay, old woman, this is, she's kind of got her, her head down, okay? She's looking down and this is her mouth. That's her chin. This is her nose. It's like my nose, okay? This is messing me up a lot, okay? And those are her eyelashes. And then that's her hair and she's got some kind of hood on. Okay, so you saw that, right? The old one? You didn't see the young one. Okay, so like look away for a minute and um, it's like when you're tasting wine, shake that out. Okay, the young woman. Okay, so old woman is like, like this. And now the young woman's are facing in a different direction because she's, she's like, she's wearing a choker and she's like looking over her shoulder. So where's the young woman? Okay, now I can see her. The young woman's eyelash is here. That's her nose. This is the outline of her face. That is her jaw. This is her ear. And that is the choker she is wearing on her neck. Everyone see that now, the young woman? Oh, and she's got some kind of a feather. So she's, that's her nose, eyelash. She got some feather thing going on. Here's another one for you. Does anyone see motion there? Anything moving? It's not, it's completely static. It's another one. Completely static image, no motion. Here's the last one. Anyone know what's going on there neurologically? <laughs> it's very complicated. One way to think of it is that your eyes are meant to look at something for a pretty short time. And uh, they can, those neurons, so they can kind of get burned out of firing for a bit. And if one gets tired, another one does something else, maybe you can start to perceive motion. But don't quote me on that. I think there's probably a two minute neuroscience video that would explain it better than me. Um, feature detection. So you have neurons that that pick up on color, that pick up on black and white. There's also nerve cells that respond to specific features of the stimulus, like its shape, its angle, or whether it's moving. So we were messing with the motion ones there, okay? Now, uh, studies of patients with brain damage 
suggests that the brain delegates the work of processing motion, form, depth, and colors to different areas of the brain. And it's like the, the, when you see something, the brain takes it apart and then it has to reintegrate them into your perceived image. Um, cats who are raised um, only being able to see one particular thing. So this poor cat, they do research on cat vision at Dalhousie if, if you're interested. Um, so this cat is being raised in an environment where it can only see these vertical lines. It can't, it has that collar on so it can't see its own body. That's all I can see. When that cat grows up, that's all it can see. It can't see horizontal stuff. So if you take the cataracts off an older person's eyes, you're like, wow, I can see again. I see so clearly. But let's say there's somebody that um, they had cataracts over their eyes since birth or some kind of obstruction since birth. And then at the same age of, of 60, you remove that obstruction. That person gonna be happy with the clarity of their vision? No, they're gonna be like the first people getting cochlear implants. Right? It's gonna be a cacophony of stimulation that their brains don't know how to deal with because they haven't developed that ability. Yes. Um, my, uh, my, a friend of mine actually has one of the Dell research cats. Oh yeah. And they had uh, sewed its eyes shut for the first few months of its life to see how it would like process like mm -hmm. sensory intake. And does it, have you met the cat? I have met the cat. And does the eye, the cat have like strange looking eyes kind of almost like. Um, one of them is like normal, but the other one is like closed more and like looks a little bit weird. Like you can definitely tell that the cat wasn't like fully functional. Yeah, like it, it looks like as soon as you see the cat's face, you know something's, something's yeah, different. Yes, yeah, I've, I've met one of them as well. How did they get the cat? I don't, I don't know how they got the cat. They adopted it from Dow, but I'm not sure if Dow actually adopts out the cats or if they're the agency or if they just meet somebody. Like. So the cat that, that I met, I met one of those cats was snuck out because it would have been euthanized. Snuck out, yeah. Like at the end of an experiment, the I animals that, are sacrificed. That happens with some of them is that like, people just kind of like. Well, like it. we really like this one and no one's going to notice us taking this one away. I, I did work in an animal research lab at one point. And it was it's very difficult. difficult yes. Um, okay, so there are gestalt principles that explain the sort of higher order processing. So we tend to organize pieces of information to an organized whole. That is a German word is gestalt, and gestalt psychologists propose some principles by which we organize sensations into perception. Um, you are, there's one called proximity. So these spaced lines, you're probably seeing three lines, like three bars and not six lines because your brain is organizing this into a hole and that into a hole and that. Then one of them is continuity. So you're probably seeing that as a straight line and this is a wavy line overlaid on top of it rather than as something else. You could say, all right, this is a piece and you know, that's a different piece. No, you're not doing that, okay? And then closure is what was going on when you saw that cube that wasn't really there. You're probably seeing triangles that aren't really there. Pretty convincing white triangles. Okay. It's the principle of closure. How many legs does the elephant have? Well, closure might be messing you up there. Oh, what you interpret as a space between the legs can really throw you off. Because you might see that space here as another leg. Depth perception is about our ability to see objects in three dimension, even though what the images that strike your retina at the level of uh, sensation are two dimensional. So your brain has to build that 3D picture and that allows us to judge distance. And it's something that we know is present at birth because of this, um, this ledge experiment, basically where there's, there's glass there and, and the baby will like, no, you're not going to mommy. So that test is how we know that a baby can sense 
has a sense of depth perception. Um, and that is based on the disparity between what's coming in on your two eyes. Your brain can keep the rest. There are monocular depth cues. So even if you close one eye, you haven't completely lost your depth perception. You still have a sense that something is further away and something's closer. So students who are closer to me appear bigger than students who are farther, further away. Like mm, you're this big, and you're that big, okay? There's a bunch of them. Um, one of them is interposition. So I can't see the guy behind you because you're in his way, right? That's called obstruction. It helps me figure out that he's actually behind you. Um, things that are further in the distance look kind of smaller and shorter, and they also look a bit more blue in color. So there's a bunch of monocular depth to use, which means that if you only had one eye, you still have a, a sensation of distance. We struggle a bit more than cats with motion perception. Cats are great at it. We're not so great at it. Um, when large and small objects move at the same speed, the large objects appear to move more slowly. So there's this weird effect if you're in a car and it looks like things are passing that are closer to your car passing by really quickly, but things that are further away are not. I'm sure you've experienced that, that sense of flow. And if, let's say, one light goes off in front of another, and you'll see that on a lot of signs, it looks to us as if there's one kind of light that's moving along. Well, it's not, right? One's turning on, and then another one's off, and another one's on. We don't interpret it like that. So vision is about light waves, and hearing is about sound waves. And if we look at the sound wave, we could see how, how tight the waves are. So in a, a short wavelength, we hear a higher pitched sound. And in a long wavelength, we hear a low pitched sound. And now these waves could be taller or they could be shorter. We call that amplitude. And a loud sound has a high amplitude, a great amplitude, and then a soft sound has a small amplitude. But they're shorter, right? And sound is measured in something called decibels. So your textbook explains the neural process of transduction, how the sound wave gets processed and finally interpreted in your auditory context. Since we started a little late in the interest of time, I'll skip over this. There are also, just like with vision, there are a couple of competing, competing theories of how we uh, hear perceive pitch. And they turned out to be both kind of right. So, but for, for, different, um, for different pitches, okay? Just like we use our two eyes to judge where something is in terms of depth perception, we have two ears. And if something's close to you, it'll hit your closer ear a little bit sooner than it'll hit the ear on the other side of your head. And your brain uses that to compute the location of the sound. Um, there are sounds that will damage your hearing, as I'm sure your parents have all told you, okay? And it starts at a, around 85 decibels, which is the sound of a, a busy street corner. So it's, it's actually a lot less loud than you might expect. Um, when you study the neural transduction of sound, you'll read that there's things called hair cells that respond to the sound wave. And now think of listening to loud sounds as walking across the carpet, okay? If you don't do that too often, you do that now and then you walk across the carpet and it, uh, the carpet fibers would spring back. Now, if you left a really heavy piece of furniture on that for a long time, it's like listening to something too loud for a long time. It's kind of gonna damage that cell and it won't be able to recover at a certain point. 
hearing loss can happen in a couple of different ways. So you could damage the receptors, like in that carpet example, or the, the damage can happen sort of higher up, can be associated with the way those bones transmit vibrations to the auditory nerve. So there's conduction hearing loss, for instance, and that would be about damage to the mechanical system that conducts the sound waves to the cochlea. There's something called a cochlear implant that can help get around that. It's a device that converts the sounds into electrical signals and then stimulates the auditory nerve. And that is one way people who are born deaf can appear. Okay. Um, so I'd like to discuss a little bit the way the textbook talks about hearing loss. It's on this page over here. And there were a few things about that that sort of jumped out at me. And it was how disability is being constructed, right? As part of a disease and a burden. It's part of a global burden of disease. Do you hear those words? Burden, disease, okay? As directly related to poor choices, personal responsibility, you should have known better. Teen boys are more than teen girls blast themselves with loud music for long periods. How foolish, okay? There's a connection to exclusion and to suffering. Hearing loss is therefore the great invisible disability. To not catch someone's name, to not grasp what somebody is asking, to miss the hilarious joke is to be deprived of what others know and to sometimes feel excluded. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, isn't that like more about hearing people excluding deaf yes. people as opposed to deaf yes. people, yeah. Exactly, and they focus on the increased risk of depression and anxiety, but is that because of the hearing loss or the inability to hear or the way that they're being treated or excluded, okay? So, and there's also a focus on fixing it, like, hey, there's this thing called a cochlear implant. In reality, cochlear implants are quite controversial in the deaf community and some deaf parents actually choose not to give their deaf child a cochlear implant, okay? So there's a matter of person or environment. So do we see a person who doesn't have a certain ability as disabled or is the environment disabling, okay? So I cannot speak sign language. I never learned it. There was a couple of times that I tried and I didn't really get anywhere with it at, at all, okay? But Am I disabled because I don't speak sign language? Now, if I tried to teach this class in a school for the deaf, well, it wouldn't work, would it? Now I'd have a problem. So to some extent, yes, disability is the lack of an ability, but it's also a social construct in the sense that it's, it's a concept that arises out of social dialogue and where and how a lack of ability matters, matters to the point that we label it, this is a debility. The disability depends on context and power, right? And what context you actually need to hear with your ears and who decided that, right? Who built the environment where that is true and who got to participate in that decision? Bats are blind but they're not constructed as having a visual disability because in the environment that they are successfully adapted to, they do just great. They echolocate, they hang out in caves, they go at night. It works for them. It can be a shock to somebody like really who's lived their life in the hearing world or the seeing world to lose that, especially later in life when it's harder to adapt socially, and physically. Some people spend their whole lives without being able to see or hear, and they have vibrant lives and communities all the same. So that professional drummer there is a deaf person who has a deep appreciation for vibration. And that's what sound ultimately is, right? however you perceive it and the music that it makes. Beethoven wrote some of his greatest works when he was deaf. So, what we have there in the textbook is one perspective, but it's coming for you in an authoritar authoritative, maybe authoritarian, no, no, wait, it's coming from an authority, but it is one perspective from an author who is late deaf and or hard of hearing. And it does center able-bodied norms. And I would say 
if we had a dialogue about this, it would benefit from more perspectives from people who are born deaf, for instance. Deaf people might not identify as disabled at all, okay? Because they'll say, well, we have language. Maybe they have sign language. Um, they have a culture. It's almost like an ethnicity in some ways. So, and they'll, they'll talk about deaf gain. So you've heard about how kind of how bad deafness is. There's the, the, the burden of disease and the exclusion and the feeling shut out and you don't get the joke, but they'll write about deaf gain. So people who've lost their hearing have increased capabilities in spatial and facial recognition, image detection, peripheral processing. And they use that to make social contributions. Why don't we talk about that? Who decides how we frame this? So I want you to be aware of that. On to touch. Um, touch is very important developmentally, super important for babies. If you've had a baby, had a friend with a baby, you know, you're supposed to like have that skin to skin contact. Okay. Touch is actually a mix of four distinct senses, like at the receptor level, pressure, warmth, cold and pain. And your more complex touch sensations are some kind of a combination of that or a play on that. So itch is very low intensity pain. Wet is the combination of cold and pressure receptors going off. And when I read this for the first time, I was like, wait, what? And I was going around touching like metal things that were cold to see if it was true. Like, does that feel wet? And I realized, hmm, it doesn't talk about other complexities, about like say friction or whether you have sort of water moving over your finger. But basically you've got four distinct sensors at the receptor level and your complex feelings of touch are built out of that. Pain is one of them. Pain is adaptive. You shift around in your seats because your joints are getting tired. It makes you uncomfortable and you move to relieve them. And you do that the whole time you're here. Okay, that helps keep you in shape in a way. That discomfort is important. There are some people who are not able to feel pain. Imagine if you just could not feel pain. Is that a good thing? No, I see you say. Okay. They usually die very young in childhood, their lives are definitely complicated. So they wouldn't know soon enough when they've cut themselves. And so then that cut can go and get infected. They wouldn't know how much of an impact is damaging, right? Pain tells you that. There was one who died at the age of, I think it was about 17 after jumping off a one story roof. You know that that's a bad idea because you've taken smaller jumps and you're like, ah. okay. And someone who doesn't have that lived experience doesn't quite understand that even though you could Maybe verbally tell that person, if you jump off a building, you'll die. If they break a bone, they could just go around walking on it. They might not know that anything's happened until there's some really obvious swelling, that something's wrong. In terms of controlling pain, pain is obviously very aversive. Um, there's many things we can do. So because of the, the particular way that pain um, impulses are sent to the brain. You can actually sort of block it and acupuncture will do that. You'll notice maybe when you got your COVID shots, which are pretty uncomfortable, you might do something like dig your um, nails into your, your flesh. And that pain might be a little less emotionally uncomfortable than the, the new scary thing that's, that's happening in your arm. Okay, so blocking works. Um, when you get hurt, the body might release endorphins that make you feel better and, and help you run away from dragons. Um, distraction, right? Just not paying attention to it, trying to focus on something else helps with pain. Dissociation, dissociation means, it's kind of like distraction. You're not really here now, you're off thinking of something else. Um, has anyone ever had morphine? It's really interesting. Because awesome. <laughs> the pain is still there, but you're like, I don't care. Um, and expectations matter. Uh, people with, um, we've talked about how sensitive, incredibly sensitive your fingertips are. People with type one diabetes prick those fingertips all day long. And they take needles, multiple needles a day. And sometimes people will say to them, how can you do that? Doesn't that hurt? 
And they're kind of like, yeah, so what? It's just not constructed as a problem, though the pain is real. But there's other people that will, you know, faint at the sight of anything. And that has to do with, you know, what, what it means to you and your expectations. So since um, attention and expectations matter so much to pain perception, placebos make a difference because placebos play on expectations and maybe help you relax, for instance. Taste involves several basic sensations, just like, um, just like feeling does, right? Sweet, sour, salty, bitter. And then there's one called umami, and it's kind of a meaty, soy saucy, proteiny kind of taste. And different parts of your, your tongue have taste buds that respond selectively to these different tastes. And it has an important survival function. We're a little bit more skeptical of bitter tastes that could be, that could represent food that's gone off. And so you have on, on each bump that you see on your, your tongue, there's about 200 taste buds. And each taste buds has a pore, about, I don't know, 75-ish taste receptors. And each receptor reacts to different kinds of food, food molecule. So the interaction is with the molecule and the receptor. It's not like a wave, like lighter hearing is. It sends that to the brain. Smell is an interesting one, it's such an ancient, ancient one, okay? So it's another chemical sense that involves many different receptors and different combinations of receptors identify different complex scents. And so there's that molecular interaction with the receptor. And then that gets sent up to something called the olfactory bulb, which is kind of behind your eyes. It's in like a lower brain region. It's very ancient, okay? So taste and smell come with some very ancient circuitry that we find specialized in like lower, simpler brain regions. Now, if you look at the way uh, things connect to the olfactory bulb, um, what do you think might happen if let's say your brain kind of rocked in its skull? You had a concussion forward and back. You could shear those connections off. So one of the things that can happen after a concussion is loss of the sense of smell. Uh, the brain circuitry for smell also connects with those kind of midbrain areas for memory storage. That explains why smells can strongly trigger memories. And that helps us understand odor's power to evoke feelings, memories. There's like a hotline between the brain areas that receives information from the nose and the brain centers associated with emotions and memories. Uh, now, if you've sort of fallen in love with somebody, what uh, at first encounter might have been the personal musk, right? Kind of a, the body smell of sweat kind of changes and you start to perceive it differently and it can become a sort of an attractive, intoxicating odor. Your perception completely changes. Now, I've been talking about these senses as if they were kind of separate, but really they all integrate. So if you're eating strawberry ice cream, it might taste a bit more strawberry if you had red food color in it, right? That's part of your entire gestalt perception of strawberry ice cream is more than just taste, okay? And it might taste better if it's an expensive artisanal ice cream or if that's what the tub says than if it were in that yellow no-name kind of brand tub, okay? So expectations matter. Um, if you've ever seen a, a silent movie, especially if you know what the actor sounds like and you have the subtitles on, say volume off, subtitles on, and you know what that person sounds like, you can hear them talking. That's how connected all these things really are. And there's research on, on interference. So the reaction time for, if I say what that word is, so if I had, it, it's easy when the, the red word is in red, but what if the red word was in green or the green word is in red? takes people longer to figure that one out. Right? Reaction times are slower for that. Talked about the five senses. They're actually seven. So kinesthesia is your sense of position. You're aware of that and it interacts with your vision. And then you have a vestibular sense that involves your kind of ear canals and your cochlea. So if you spin around and you stop, you feel like you're still spinning. Okay. 
even though we started late, um, we did make it on time. So I'm happy to take any questions. Your quiz eight is due on Sunday at five as usual. So please keep in mind the policy for extensions and extenuating circumstances. And we'll be talking about, oh, that's wrong, emotion on Tuesday. And we're at 2.15, so thank you very much for your attention.